Hello and welcome to Foreign Correspondent. My name is Luke Sheehan. Today we will be talking about overworked grade 9 students in the subject of humanities. And also, today we will cross to our reporter in the field, Jonathan Jones, who has conducted a very special interview with a World War One sniper named Billy Singh. Now let's cross to Jonathan in the field for this groundbreaking interview about a real soldier's life during, before and after the war. Thanks, Luca. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Jones, and this man right here is Billy Singh. Say hi, Billy. Guy. Billy was a part of World War One and was the most celebrated and recognised Australian sniper in Australian war history, with a staggering 300 kills. Billy is of Chinese origin, with English blood as well. He was raised in Clermont, Queensland, as it, and is an excellent sharpshooter and horse rider. Billy, today I'm going to ask you a few questions about your time during, before and after the war. Can we get started? Yeah, sure. Let's get started. At the beginning of World War I, being of Chinese origin was hard. Can you please give us some context on how you disobeyed the laws of war and joined up to fight for Australia? Well, back when the war started, a younger and much more stupid Billy wanted to sign up to do his country proud. But joining war wasn't that easy for a boy like me. Back when the war started, there was this thing going around called the anti-Chinese disestablishment, which completely marginalised all people with Chinese ancestry living outside of China. I tried joining the war, but at first they denied me because of my Chinese ancestry. But funny enough, the second time I signed, after a month or so, they actually read my files and saw my skills in shooting and horse riding. Two older men called John and Christopher, while well, they took my files to a recruitment officer, and insisted he put me on the roster to be shipped to fight in the war. And just like that, I was accepted. They claimed they chose to disregard that I was part Chinese. And just like that, I was off to fight for my country as a part of the Anzac Corps in Gallipoli. But boy oh boy, I had no idea what I was in for. So Billy, when you arrived in Gallipoli, you received two certain nicknames. One being the Assassin, and the other being the Murderer. Why do you believe you received these names? Well, not to brag, but I'm an excellent shot. You see, I was raised on a farm. For work, I would help my dad make milk deliveries or help my mum in the garden. But in my free time, I'd practice my shooting or go horse riding, depending on the season. Back then, us Chinese men weren't appreciated, so my dad, who was a drover, taught me how to shoot a gun, you know, for protection. The gun hubby sort of stuck. I practiced throughout my own life and became quite the sharpshooter joining clubs, winning tournaments, while still achieving academically. The reason I was giving these names was because when I shot around, I shot to kill, no hesitation. Would you describe yourself as a liberator or a murderer? I believe I'm a liberator, because like everyone else, I killed to survive. I've killed 300 men. These women people once, but once they picked up a gun and killed, they weren't men no more and the ghost of war replaced them. The truth is, we are all murderers. Everyone who joins the war becomes one, thinking that they are doing the right thing, killing for their country. But is it right to take a man's life just because they are on the wrong side? I kill for others as a real liberator, but when I kill, aren't I a murderer as well? Did you ever feel sorry for the people you were killing on the battlefield? <laughs> well, I felt something for the poor buggers. All they wanted to do was their country proud, but then I remember. What they did to us when we first landed on that beach. How their snipers picked off her officers and their guns slaughtered our men before they even made it to shore. When I kill a man, I remember that day and heart in my heart. The men I was killing, they weren't people no more. They was killers, just like everyone on the bloody battlefield. I killed to protect. I would never kill a stretcher bearer who was trying to save a man all bloody and wounded. Although, if I saw a Turk all alone in no man's land, I would put him out of his own misery. Nobody deserves to suffer a fate that cruel. It says here, after you were evacuated from Gallipoli in December 1915, you were sent to England to train to fight in France as part of the 31st Battalion. What was the difference between the Western Front and Gallipoli? Well, my, lo my role in Gallipoli was quite substantial because I was a sniper. I was needed all hours. As for the Western Front, snipers weren't vital to battle. Although I was put to good use, 
I was placed in the anti-sniper campaign of Polygon Wood. My job was to eliminate as many snipers as I could so troops had a clear path through to the opposition. Also, the Western Front was a lot more walking and moving each day or week. As for Gallipoli, we mainly stayed in one area for months on end. Once you think about it, they weren't that different, but they still gave new roles for me in the war in different kinds of ways. Due to your excellent sniping reputation, the name Billy Singh was known very well by allies and enemies alike. Did your enemies try to put an end to your flawless kill count? Of course. Once those Turks knew what I can do, they wouldn't give up. They did come very close to finally getting me though. Me though. You see, I wasn't the only crack shot on the battlefield. The Turks had a dark horse sniper too. We called him Abdul the Terrible. Abdul the Terrible was an excellent shot, his skill matching mine very closely. We finally met Abdul during my time in Gallipoli. My spotter Tom Sheehan and I were at our post and Tom noticed a Turk. I took aim and realised that that Turk I was about to shoot had sights on me as well. The Turk I saw was Abdul the Terrible. I knew him from pictures shown around the trenches. We both fired a bullet, each hitting one another. My shot killed the bugger. As for his bullet, it smashed Sheehan's spyglass, going straight through his hands, mouth and piercing his cheek. The bullet made its way to me and hit me square in the shoulder. Once the Turks noticed I had killed their prized sniper, they aimed all their heavy artillery right in our position and fired. But lucky for me and Tom, we were already far away from that godforsaken sniping post. Poor Tom got hurt bad. His jaw was broken by the bullet and he was in horrible pain. He was shipped back home to Australia because he was unfit for service. As for me, I was back on the battlefield a week after my time in the hospital. You see, that was the only time I was hurt during my many months of service. Really do wish my luck lasted though. In May 1917, you received a gunshot to the leg and you were then hospitalized. Whilst you were recovering, what did you do? Oh, those were the days. My leg was absolutely messed. The bullet went straight through my leg and hurt like hell. I got sent to England to recover for a while. Then I had to be back on the battlefield once my leg had healed. During my time away from the war, I went to Scotland. I mean, why wouldn't I? This is my first time in real civilization ever since I was shipped to the trenches, and I wanted to make the most of it. One day, in Scotland, I was in a bar, and a beautiful waitress served me. Her name was Elizabeth Stewart, and she was the daughter of the Royal Navy cook, George Stewart. Elizabeth and I really seemed to like each other, and not long after, I proposed to her. We, we were married in Edinburgh on the 29th of June. Within a month of our marriage, I was back to war to fight in the tre trenches of France. When I was finally discharged from the war due to my multiple problems, I tried my hardest to get her over to Australia so she could live with me. No matter how hard I tried, she never came. I later found out that she married an Englishman and had two kids, but sadly, none of them were mine. I'm really sorry to hear that you didn't get to create a life with Elizabeth. And I'm led to believe that other wounds finally got the best of you. Which brings us to the next question. After two and a half years of intense battle, you visited the war hospital one last time after a gunshot to the back. Also in that hospital, you were diagnosed with lung disease after multiple exposures to poison gas. You were praised unfit for duty and you were sent home. When you arrived back in Australia, what was it like settling back into urban life? I was happy to be home, but getting home was like seeing a ghost. Things had changed. I had changed. When I joined the war, they promised us fame, honour. All I got were a few medals and some horrible battle scars. I knew that when I got back, I had to settle down, get a job, have some kids. But since Elizabeth, I just couldn't get married and start a family, because I still thought she would come here and we could start a life together. She never did. Job-wise, it was hard for a wounded soul like me. I worked as a stockman for a while. That didn't last. Then I tried sheep farming. Little did I know, the land I was given was a poor quality. It wasn't long before I gave up. The most I made was a couple of pennies. Then I thought, maybe becoming a gold miner would help me strike big and become rich. I used to go to the mine near my property in Clermont. No matter how long I mined, there was nothing left to make me a millionaire. I moved to McCleary, Brisbane, because it was cheaper to live there. My older sister Beatrice lived nearby as well. My final job was as a labourer. It all went downhill from there. During your later life, did your destructive past affect you? What does things to people? It changes us into lifeless bodies, just waiting for something new to happen, but never being satisfied with what we got. The war was my glory days. Everyone knew my name. But in the end, I was just an old Anzac who lives in a shack. 
My past injuries and sicknesses all came back again, and twice as hard. I was weak, and I just couldn't go on. I died in a boarding house in the West End because of heart failure. I was living in complete poverty for a couple of months. In my final days, the only thing I had left was my cheap cabin and five shillings. I died in West End on the 19th of May, 1943. The Second World War had already started, yet my life had come to a solid end. War wasn't the death of me. The thing that killed me was wanting it back. I just wanted to feel important again. Life sure hit you hard towards the end of your life. It's just interesting to hear a real soldier's perspective on what war can really do to you. What medals did you receive for your time in the war, and how did your legacy live on in society? The funny thing is, people only started caring about me after I was long dead. I was given two medals during my time in the war. The first I received was the Distinguished Conduct Medal. It was given to men who had shown distinguished, gallant and good conduct in the field. It was a soldier's medal, one only received if you did your country proud. The second medal I received during my time in the Western Front of France. It was of Belgian origin and it was named the Quarx de Guerre. It was a bronze medal, with a rampant lion in the middle, and on the flip side, two cross swords. The medal was given to soldiers who had shown excellent bravery and had served on the front line for three years or more. I also had two other medals. Don't know what they were called, to be honest. Did it matter, though? Not like I knew they, where they went once I got older. Yes, strange. After you had died, you were recognised as a war hero. People started knowing your name. A statue was built for you in your hometown in Clermont. Your medals were shown in the Australian War Memorial. You even got your own TV show in 2010. Billy, I have an, had an excellent time talking to you about your time in the war and what you thought about the battles you took place in and war in general. Now it's time to get back to Luca in the studio. Thank you.